Hey friends, how you doing? Welcome back. Uh, what a great uh, Holy Week we had last week, uh, both uh, online and uh, in person here at Union Avenue Baptist Church. It was uh, just a, a blessing to welcome people here on the campus each day last week uh, to be a part of uh, each of the significant days uh, leading up to the crucifixion and ultimately the res resurrection. It was a great uh, Good Friday service uh, evening here uh, at the church as well as on the Easter day itself, Sunday uh, this past week. And it really got me to reflecting and thinking about uh, the significance of the local church and making our way through the remainder part of the book of Joshua. But uh, exactly what does it mean as we uh, return back at the here at the what we are hoping is the end of the pandemic and as we're making our way back on campus and what will these weekly messages take on? What will the look of them be? And um, I wanted to kind of segue today and start talking about that following Jesus means committing your life to uh, being a member of a local church, a local congregation. We hear the word local all the time, you know, buy local, shop local, eat local. But I think it's also significant to look at what it means to be a part of a local congregation. And so, friends, I think groups of people, including the resources that we've been blessed with and the resources that we have and how we use those resources, matter to God and matter to God significantly, I believe. I mean, today in my email, I, uh, I, I like many of you, subscribe to several different email news briefings or email uh, devotional thoughts. And I got one today from the Baptist Press and it caught my attention and uh, so much so that I printed it out and I wanted to share with you uh, a little bit about Union Avenue Baptist Church and the significance of the local congregation that's been here at uh, 2181 Union Avenue for 120 plus years. The article started out by talking about this day in Baptist history. And uh, actually it's this week in Baptist history. So the week of April 23rd, 1984, the article was titled The Passing of Ramsey Pollard. And if you will, allow me to read just a little bit here. It says the former Southern Baptist Convention president, Ramsey Pollard, age 81, died on the 20th of April at Baptist Memorial Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, following a brief illness. Pastor Pollard was a pastor of churches in his native Texas and in Florida before going to Broadway Baptist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee in 1939. He stayed in the Knoxville Church for nearly 21 years before becoming pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church located in Memphis in 1960, where he stayed until his retirement in 1972. He was a graduate of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, and received a Distinguished Alumni Award from the institution in 1966. He was awarded the honorary degrees by Carson Newman College in Jefferson City, Tennessee, and the Atlanta College of Law in Atlanta, Georgia. Since his retirement, Pollard has kept busy with revivals and being an interim pastor, recently serving as the interim pastor of Union Avenue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. He was the pastor of the Southern Baptist Convention for two years and was president of the Tennessee Baptist Convention in 1954. What does that have to do about the local church? I find it interesting that as I have been processing and thinking about the significance of the local church, that today I get that email identifying Union Avenue as part of a legacy of an individual that served greatly within our denomination. And if it wasn't for the significance that the local church played into it, what would his significance have been? Would it have been as lengthy as just the introduction lines of his obituary called out and identified there in the Baptist Press as it was written in 1984? I asked the church on Easter Sunday, I commended them and asked them to celebrate in the fact that they were part of a 120 year tradition here on this campus at 2181 Union Avenue, that being the gathering of the local church. And what I want us to ponder about and think about as we continue looking in Joshua, matter of fact, in Joshua chapter 19, we see the continued inheritance of the land being divided out. And that inheritance could be, I think, equated to today the different locations of local churches that we see here in America and across our world. And what I want to talk about is that local church idea. I want you to think about what your relationship is with the church in the past. When we look at the past of the local church, and particularly here at Union Avenue, what was it like? Some of you watching may remember the day when Dr. Pollard was the interim pastor here at Union Avenue leading up to his death. 
Some of you may re remember some of the great pastors of the past here at Union Avenue and the not so great ones, but you remember the significance of the land and why it was placed here. So I want you to think about that for a second, the relationship with the church in the past. Now, as you've got that in your mind, what is your relationship with the church today? Is it all online motivated? Is it some in person, some online? Have we backed away from the church because we've gotten comfortable being away from the church? Does the local church still have the impact for you today that it did in that relationship with you in the past? See, the reason I bring this up is because in the New Testament, the word translated church is used 114 times. 90 of those refer to the local church in a specific city or in an area. And the New Testament defines the local church as a local body of baptized believers. And if we want to follow Christ, His church must be central to our lives as disciples. My question is, is central to our lives as disciples, has that changed because the local congregation is not necessarily the in-person congregation. Maybe it's our online gathering or our podcast gathering or our Sermon Central gathering that we may find ourselves listening to or a part of. See, the church, I believe, is God's conduit to bless both individual believers but also to bless the nations. God's mission in the world is carried out through the agency of His church. You simply cannot be a devoted disciple of Christ and you cannot make disciples of Christ apart from being totally committed to a local congregation, a local fellowship, a local group of believers. When we open up in the New Testament, and I know I said we were going to be in Joshua, but you'll see the connection here in a bit. But what I want to talk about is how Paul identifies um, in the book of Ephesians. Paul names seven basic spiritual realities that unite all true believers together under one umbrella, under one gathering, under one identity, and that is, I think, the local church. If you will, take your copy of God's Word with me, and I want you to look with me in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. And in this writing, I want you to read along with me as we focus in on how Paul identifies what the aspect is or what the significance is of that one church. If you will, look with me in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. He goes on to write there to the church at Ephesus, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your one call. Verse 5, it says, There was one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. There was one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measures of the gift afforded us by Christ. So, when thinking about the importance of the local church, and obviously today, as I was reminded via this Baptist Press article, Union Avenue Baptist Church has a significance. And when we think about the importance of the local church and its inheritance that's afforded the members, Paul is correct, Paul is correct about that body of fellowship. I mean, there in verse 4, he opened up by saying one body. If you'll look back with me in your copy of God's Word, there in verse 4, it says there is one body. Well, this is, of course, the body of Christ in which each believer is a member. It's placed there at conversion by the Spirit of God. The one body is the model for many local bodies that God has established across the world. Let's keep breaking this down. It says there's one body and one spirit. Friends, I think that the same Holy Spirit indwells in each believer so that we belong to each other in the Lord. The text goes on. It says there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope. There's one hope of your calling, and that refers to the return of the Lord to take His church to heaven. The Holy Spirit within is the assurance of this great promise. See, Paul, I think, is suggesting here that the believer who realizes the existence of the one body, who walks in the one spirit and who looks for the Lord's return, is going to be a peacemaker and not a troublemaker. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, which is one Lord. So our one Lord, this is our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, who lives for us, and one day will what? Come for us. It's difficult to believe that two believers can claim to obey the same Lord and yet not be able to walk together in unity. It says in one Lord, and then he goes on to say in one Lord and in one faith. There is one settled body of truth deposited by Christ in His church, and that is the faith. 
in the small book of Jude that we've studied previously here on the campus. Jude calls it the faith by which one, the faith by which was once delivered unto the saints there in Jude in verse 3. It goes on, it says there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism there in verse 5. Since Paul here was previously discussing the one body, this one baptism is probably the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The act, that the, the act of the Spirit when he places the believing sinner into the body of Christ at conversion. As far as one body is concerned, there is one baptism, and that is the baptism of the Spirit. But as far as local bodies of believers are concerned, there are two baptisms. There's the baptism of the Spirit and water baptism. So we see there that there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism in verse 5. In verse 6, it says there's one God and one Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. I think Paul does this well here. Paul likes to emphasize God as Father. The marvelous oneness of believers in the family of God is evident here. For God is over all, working through all, and in all. We are children in the same family, loving and serving the same Father. So we ought to be able to walk together in unity. And then lastly, friends, Jesus has given the church this incredible privilege of knowing His truth. It says, but grace was given to each of us according to the measures of Christ's gift. We have the privilege of knowing His truth. We have the privilege of imitating His character and displaying His fullness I really believe that the mission is Christ, the mission of Christ is completed through the obedience of his local church, and that love is the distinguishing mark of that mission. See, we are called to love those inside the church, and we do that extraordinarily well, but we're also called to share the love of Christ to the world by proclaiming his gospel and sharing his story and his narrative, like we did this past week during the Holy Week series and during our time on Resurrection Sunday. But I think there is a bigger question here and a bigger connecting point that we look at and ask, how does this tie back to the elongated study that we've been doing during the study in the book of Joshua? Well, this coming Sunday here on the campus, we'll find ourselves in Joshua chapter 19. And in Joshua chapter 19, we start seeing the inheritance of the land, the final distribution of it, the final divvying out of the lands that were promised to the nation of Israel. And there in chapter 19, we will read the inheritance for Simeon and Zebulun. We will also see, starting there in verse 17, the inheritance for Issachar and the, and the inheritance for Asher in verses 24. We'll read through the inheritance for Nephali and for Dan in verses 40. But the exciting thing is at the end, when it ends there in verse 51, as we see the inheritance for Joshua, it says, These are the inheritance that Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun in the hands of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel, distributed by lot at Shiloh before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of the meeting. So they finished dividing the land. The best of the land and the end of the land was saved for the one that was claiming the land, and that was Joshua. Friends, we've been given a great resource in our local church. We've been given a great responsibility in being able to go and proclaim and to share. And it's easy to look back at the past and to realize the great individuals that have stood within the pulpit of Union Avenue Baptist Church and proclaimed and challenged and pushed and championed the membership to go and to teach, to go and to baptize and to put forth the name of the gospel. There when Joshua and all the inhabitants claimed the promised land, they were to protect it forever and ever moving forward, that it was going to be known as the Holy Land, the land that we often read about is flowing with milk and honey. The local church should be that as well. It should represent the one body, the one faith, the one baptism, the one Lord, and the one faith in all in all. So whether you are watching for the first time or this is the continued time that you've gathered with us, let me encourage you to come back to the body of faith. Come back to the in-person gatherings. And you can hear, as you will, as I often say in the words of Paul Harvey, the rest of the story or the rest of my sermon or thought on this idea of maintaining the local body and preserving the inheritance that we've been given. I mean, when we read this old obituary notice from 1984 and we realize all the great things that Ramsey Pollard did, he did so through the work of the local church. What work are you doing 
the local church meant something to you at one time, use it today to impart the knowledge and the words that you receive to somebody else. Share with them the importance of the local church, just like you would share with them the importance of eating local or shopping local or supporting the small businesses in our community. So I thank you for logging on today, for working through and becoming a part of this time together as we sit down and focus in on God's Word, as together we read it, as we learn from it, and apply it. Will you join with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, God, we love you. And Lord, we love the local church. We know because of its significance, it's mentioned in the New Testament, that it has importance for the believers, those that are within the walls of it, as we see physically here, as well as the significance of being charged and commanded and given the ability to go and to proclaim and to teach and to profess your good news to the nations around us. And so, Lord, whether it's the divvying up of the inheritance of the land and the promised land, or whether it's the acknowledgement of the unity of the saints that gather under one roof, Lord, I thank you for the significance of the local church. I thank you for the celebrations that we've just finished through Holy Week and through Resurrection Sunday. Lord, I pray that we would take that knowledge, that we would look at the history and the significance of what uh, is expected of us and what has been done in the past and what is expected of us as we move forward, that we would take your word, that we would read it, that we would learn from it, and that we would seek to apply it in all that we do. So, Lord, we love you, and Lord, we thank you for our local congregation of faith. For your precious holy name we do pray, and amen.